welcome um, Ryan Marion, who is actually one of our co-founders at BioRender here. He leads um, a lot of really important functions here, but we'll call him the head of business, um, was part of the spawning of BioRender itself four years ago. So welcome. You'll get to uh, meet him through the panelists today. Um, Thank you, Shiz. We also have uh, Dr. Danielle Matsushima, and um, um, she comes with a wealth of expertise uh, working with faculty to create very clear uh, grant proposals. Um, and she herself has read quite a few, um, I think probably in the hundreds or thousands, I don't even know the number, but um, you've seen uh, funded and unfunded summary statements and grants. So um, comes with a wealth of knowledge, also joined our Visualize event, and that was one of the most um, attended, well-attended events there. Um, and Dr. Shikanov, did I pronounce that correctly? Perfect. Yes, excellent. So Dr. Shikanov has also won um, R01s as well as foundation grants and many others. She's very passionate about mentoring grad students, postdocs in learning how to write grants um, and in creating great visuals. And of course, uh, Dr. Turnbaugh, who you've just heard from, a seasoned grant writer and reviewer um, and NMHD study section member, I get that right. Um, and as I mentioned, over 100,000 citations and H index of 57. Um, I think without further ado, I'd love to open it up for uh, Ryan to take over. Thank you, Shiz. And thank you everyone for, for joining. Um, I just want to make sure we have the, the speaker views all set up properly. Uh, I know hopefully they are. I think they look good to me. Okay, great. Yeah, so thanks, everyone. Really, really exciting. I mean, the, the first two talks were, were incredibly inspirational. Um, Daniel and Peter really, really learned a ton from that. I hope everyone else in the audience did too. And I actually maybe want to, to pull on one of, uh, Peter, one of your slides where, where you referenced, you know, how you were creating a, creating a grant and thinking that it got better each time for that Innovators Award. Um, where the reviewers, you know, were actually feeling the opposite. So, you know, one of the things I think it might be really helpful for everyone is, you know, and we find it really, really good, you know, and really important to buy or try to always put ourselves in what we call like the end user shoes and sort of live their life as much as possible when they're using BioRender. In this case, if you're writing a grant, it would be, you know, trying to put yourself in the reviewer's shoes as much as possible. So maybe to kind of help set the stage, um, if, if each of you, uh, Peter, Ariel, and, Dan and Danielle could, could kind of share with our audience a little bit about, you know, what, what is your routine when you go to review grants and read grants and assess grants? Like, you know, do you, are you sitting at home? Are you at the office? Do you have a big stack? Can you review them like one at a time? Um, do you go through, you know, a, a little bit of each one? Like walk us through, you know, what, what it looks like when you're doing it and what's on your mind so that, you know, everyone else in the audience can then really try to put themselves in your shoes as you start going through tips and tricks afterwards. Um, maybe we want to start off, yeah, why don't Peter, you just finished, why, why don't we start with you and then we can go to uh, Danielle and then to um, Ariella. Sure, yeah. Um, so I guess I should say I'm really not a procrastinator, which, <laughs> so, you know, I think the answer is gonna depend on uh, what sort of personality type you're talking about. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I typically, you know, right now I'm a, a standing member of a study section. So we meet three times a year. Um, I'll typically get five to 10 grants to review. And then I sort of dive in as soon as I can, you know, I'll, I'll dedicate a, a day or, or a few days um, to reviewing the grants, um, you know, start in the morning when I'm fresh and have a coffee. And then I'm typically like at my computer, um, sort of editing in Adobe, um, you know, just making comments all over the grant and um, trying to sort of digest what's in the content. And then I, I think in terms of what I focus on, like it really matches the slides I just showed you. So then, yeah, uh, you know, I spend my most time, um, you know, I sort of quickly read the couple sentence rationale and the abstract. I spend a lot of time on the aims page and the research plan. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the grant, I just sort of skim through as fast as I can. So, you know, NIH grants are hundreds of pages long. So there's really no way that you can read every sentence of every grant. <laughs> you can't read every sentence. That, that's, I mean, it's such an interesting thing to think about is that, you know, there's a lot of what people might write might actually not get read. And so you've got to be very clear on what, I guess, what, what it is, you know, the, the places you want to make sure people spend their time. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. Well, thank you. Um, Danielle, why don't, why, don't you, why don't you walk us through your routine? 
Hi, everyone. So I am not a reviewer on study section, but what I do do is I work with faculty to make sure that their grant is written in a clear and compelling way so that reviewers on study section um, are digesting the information more quickly. Um, awesome. and, and it's easy for them to understand. So for me, I could be at the office or I could be at home sitting on my couch late at night after my kids have gone to bed um, when I'm looking through this, but I'm, I'm really looking at it from the perspective of, do I understand as someone who's scientifically trained, but an yeah. intelligent lay person to your field, do I understand what you're trying to say and the point you're getting across? Um, so similar to what Peter said, um, I'm, I'm looking, focusing on the specific aims page first, since a lot of faculty or a lot of reviewers look at that as a roadmap for what should be in the application um, mm -hmm. and making sure that the writer is selling their work and what they're proposing to do and highlighting the impact of that work. Got it. Awesome. And, and when you're doing that, are you going through you know, one, one grant at a time, um, or do you review a lot of them briefly and, and sort of get a summary before going back and, and making deeper assessments, or how um, do you? For us, it's we tend to have a queue around grant time, and we do one at a time. Mm -hmm. We want to give each of our faculty member you know, the appropriate time for their grant. And so some grants take a few hours to review if they're well written and um, their concepts are written in a logical way, and some grants take like days to a week if it's a poorly written grant wow. um it's hard to sift through um so you know we have a team of, of four people and we around grant season which is now we we kind of divide up the grants and you go through one at a time wow so day, days to a week is a, is a lot of time to go through something so i can imagine the feeling you might have there where something that's really clear and smooth that goes through in hours feels mm -hmm. really good and compared yeah, to something that you're struggling through over days yeah, and we're trying to make recommendations to get to the point. So when it reaches the reviewer's hands, they're only spending a few hours going through the grant, right? So that, that's our goal. That is the goal. Okay, so goal is to get people to read things fast. That's, that's a clear one that I think I've, I've picked up today. And Ariel, why don't you walk us through your routine? What do you, what do, you do as, you're, as you're getting excited to, and ready to, to review a section plan? Sure, yeah, so, so hello everybody. Thank you, for, I really appreciate being here. I review for NIH um, and also for NSF, which is National Scientific Foundation in the United States. And mm -hmm. it took me a minute um, to figure out my routine. So I ask a lot of senior people. And what works for me um, is to read. So I have 10 grants to review. And then I read through all specific aims page. And mm. then I rank them. And then I know what how my pile looks like. And then I go and then I start with the best, oh, well, like highest ranked paper with, uh, grants, which is probably the top 30%, 40%. And then I leave the worst ones to the end. So basically giving them a chance. Got it. And how often that's, that's really interesting. So one thing I've taken away is that, you know, everyone has a slightly different routine. So if when you're when you're writing, you don't necessarily know what routine you're going to get in the reviewers that are reviewing your, your grants. So you almost have to think of how do you set it up to cater to a, a, a broad audience. Um, and Ariel, it's really interesting, you, know, you mentioned how you stack rank the, the grants based on the AIMS page. How, how often do you see a, a grant that was lowly, low ranked end up moving up the pile? afterwards into something that you'll say they're in the bottom 30% up to the, the top 30% and actually get funded? Not too often, but it happens, mm. right? Because ideally you want to give a grant a chance and sometimes just specific aims page is too dense. So they just didn't communicate this. Also. So sometimes the grant can save itself and it happens maybe in 25, 30% of the time, but it's not too often. Usually Got specific aims page is very reflective of the quality of the grant. That's so interesting. So it really, really, I think that really hammers home, you know, Peter, the point you made earlier is that spend all of your time on specific games page and then, and then build your, build the rest of your, your application after that. Um, Peter, how does, how does that, how does that compare to, you know, how you, how you think of the aims page and obviously it's really important to you when, do you have a, something in mind? I think that's sort of like my follow-up question would be like, is there, what's the point when you're reviewing a grant? It sounds like earlier, you know, the aims page is, is really it for you where you sort of made an initial assessment of like, is this grant going to be something that's going to get funded or is it unlikely and I'm going to be like, you know, kind of pulling it, pulling it up from the, from the bottom. Just to clarify, sorry, Peter, I don't yeah. want to cut you, but you know, I don't, I do read the whole grant and 70% of the cases, the specific aims page kind of reflects the rest of the grant. But yes, I do, I do read the whole grant. So I just want to clarify to make, to make sure I got it. So it's, it's sort of like, You've made an initial assessment, though, based on the AIMS page. Exactly. And, and, then, and then I stagger, and then it's easier for me to see the whole picture. Right. Everything that I will be reviewing for the panel. So it's almost like if the AIMS page isn't good, they, they've created a really steep hill for themselves to climb up. Um, for they can't me get and there. For the other reviewers as well, right? Yeah, so Absolutely. 
Yeah, it really I, puts I, a I lot agree. of emphasis. I think that the, like in general, the quality, you don't even need to go to Ames if you start with the abstracts. You know, the, mm, the quality of each section is pretty highly correlated in my experience. So like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it, it sort of, I would describe it as like, you know, you read somebody's abstract and you just have this sinking feeling in your gut. You're like, oh no, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be stuck oh, no. on <laughs> for eight hours, <laughs> you know, or however long it <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's there really is a judging i wouldn't say judging a book by its cover but you're certainly judging it by by your your first your early impression um on it sounds and is abstract that the page for you that does it peter is that more so than the aims page like you've already kind of made a an assessment of of the next stage in terms of how likely it is to to get to get funded yeah i think like most of the time you know if the research plan is is really solid the other parts are typically really good so mm -hmm. you know and then vice versa so yeah I, I haven't had a lot of grants or i don't know if i can think of anywhere like <laughs> the the abstract was amazing and then the research plan was bad you know gotcha yeah. no that's um, that's so interesting but yeah i would say you know one of the things this is actually the, the part i like most about study section is that you know you start by reviewing the grant on your own and, you know, I think there you can have a really firm opinion, but then, you know, the fun part is then you go and compare scores between the three reviewers that read it. Mm. And so that's where the surprises come in. Like, you know, I might think a grant is terrible, but then the next person thinks it's perfect, you know, <laughs> and then we, then we get to talk about like why I'm wrong or, or why the other person is wrong. And just to follow up on that, how, how often does that happen in, in this scenario? You know, something if, if I'm applying, it probably, you know, like, like you said, you might you might end up with one person who loves it to the don't. Um, how how often do you see that scenario? And what what is what is the outcome, or what is the thing that might might can you know convince a final outcome in those study sessions that gets you to to a decision? Yeah, it's happened. I don't know. I can't like put a number on it, but it, it's happened fairly frequently to me. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think there's sort of two. It's either that like um you know sometimes like the three reviewers have basically exactly the same score so we're totally in sync you know <laughs> mm -hmm. and, you know those are actually really boring grants to talk about because you're, you know i i mean I, I think arguably they should not be discussed like we should just you know give them the score um <laughs> but um you know uh, fairly frequently like you know the reviewers have really big differences in opinion and then you know it and fortunately it does sort of come down to like who's most convincing in the room you know because you're gonna interesting basically try to hash it out as as the three people that read it and then also like the broader study section and how they chime in yeah. got it and and Ellie, do, you, do you do you feel that you have a similar experience or you see it happens quite frequently where you see study sections have multiple multiple opinions I do agree with Peter that, you know, this moment when you open everybody else's scores is like either validation point or like, oh my God, what did I do wrong? So I think yeah, probably most of the 50% of the time is uh, it's, it's agreeable. Sometimes there's small deviation. And then hmm. sometimes it's like, really, you know, I gave it an excellent score and somebody absolutely hated it. So hmm. then you go back and you reread and make sure that you didn't miss anything. Hmm. It's so interesting. And so this is maybe a slight continuation, but I kind of want to ask a question. Like, you know, when you, when you see, and Daniel, you might be able to provide a really good insight on this one too, is like, when you see a, uh, an application that's like, you know, clearly, you know, this is not, this is like not great yet, you know, what, what is this, the, the biggest tweaks you see them go from, from being like not ready, you know, or feeling like, oh no, I'm not going to give this a good score to something that's going to get a, a, a really good score or could get a really good score. Um, so especially obviously with two weeks left in the, R01 deadline right now, like what are the things people should be focusing on to try to go from, you know, mediocre to great? It definitely depends on the grant and it could be a variety of different things. Um, so some of my suggestions will be, um, sometimes we'll get grants to review and there aren't any figures put in. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously the PI is working on them, but you know, if we're two weeks out and you haven't made any of your figures, that, that could be a red flag. So really make sure mm -hmm. you are putting figures in. Um, the other thing is, if I'm getting like a research plan to review, I do the so what test. So when anything that they write down, are they saying, re relating it back to the, the bigger picture, the larger research question and the impact. And so um, something that might be somewhat of a sparse research plan, you can go in and make things easy for the reviewers to understand what you're trying to propose just by answering so what after everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you know, that's, that's something to look at as well. 
Um, and then Got making it. sure to spell check. Um, I think a lot of our faculty at Columbia are very picky um, and mm -hmm. get distracted by details. And so if you have typos and grammar mistakes, they, they will be biased against your grant um, mm -hmm. when they're reviewing it. That's an interesting one, because I know, I know you talked about that same bias, you know, even using certain words. Um, what, what, are, what are maybe some of the things, you know, Peter and Ariel, that, that you see you know, that, that might be biases for you I would, you know, Peter, I know you've mentioned some of the words, but like, you know, maybe, so maybe Ariel, you can start us off. Like, what are some of the biases that you look for when you're reviewing a grant um, that, that come up? You know, is it just spelling and grammar, um, certain words? Is there an approach to like that, that Ames page that, you know, makes you put it in the bottom of the pile? Yeah, I mean, I think like one thing that we get a lot, maybe this is true for, or probably is true for a lot of areas. Like we get a lot of people that want to work on the microbiome, but maybe have never done anything related mm. to the microbiome. And so, you know, there are sort of these flags, you know, like, you know, flora, for example, my right. flower or, or plant. <laughs> and so, you know, if somebody says that, you know, it shows me that you, you don't actually know the terminology of the field that you're using. or you, you haven't really run your grant by somebody that works on the microbiome. And so, you know, those are sort of common red flags that we see a lot of. And Got I think it. related to that, you know, trying to, you know, this relates to impact, but the, yeah, you know, I think a lot of people make the mistake of saying like, I want to work on the microbiome. So here are aims related to the microbiome. Mm -hmm. what, what they don't explain to the reader is like why the microbiome is the answer. <laughs> so like, you need to have a reason, you know, from data or, or the literature or something that sort right. of told you that the microbiome is the answer. It can't, it can't just be intuition. You know? Got it. So it's not, you're just like, oh, you know, this is, a, I want to focus on the microbiome. So this seems like a cool place to go to, to do some research. Cause it's, you know, it, it would be, it, it's, you know, we could test it out, but there's no real validation. It's like, hey, this is the most obvious place to go through either right. preliminary data or some really strong logic. Yeah. Got it. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your really cool insight. Um, and Ariel, what about your end? What what are the what are the kind of pet peeves you see when you're stack ranking your your grants, and especially through those Ames pages, that that make you sort of cringe and and you know kind of not want to read the grant right away or assume it's it's not going to go in the direction you you're hoping. So so for a specific Ames page and for the whole grant, there are two different pet peeves. Um, so Got for the specific Ames page, I think the main point that I look for is really are the Ames. Are they can so you know the aims shouldn't depend on each other, but they should also be not disconnected, right? So there should be some sort of flow mm. and connection. And usually, if the aims are disconnected or they really depend one on another, this is this it means that the grant is just not going to work, right? Because if everything depends on aim one, what happens if aim one doesn't doesn't work? work. This is this for the aims page, but then for the the whole grant, I really re unnecessary repetition. And it's only saying because people repeat it over and over again. I'm like, I, I got, it. I get it. So let's let's talk about something else. And and it happens a lot. And, and you know, it's just bad grantsmanship. It's not necessarily that the person doesn't have something to say. They just, you know, it's bad grantsmanship. And maybe this is something that Daniela can look for because because repeat unnecessary repetition is really annoying and and kind of waste um, space. Mm, absolutely. Also, so if people are not familiar with other people's work and really say mm -hmm. things. Like Peter just mentioned, you know, that like really don't justify uh, what they're writing about. It's also kind of, it shouldn't be getting funding. So it sounds like, it, you know, it, we've heard some repetition on this one a few times today now. It's like on the aims, like they can't be overly connected or, or dependent on each other because then there's like a single point of failure on that on that application. Um, but they also can't be so disconnected where it's like you're shooting in the dark, it sounds like. So you, you're looking for like a certain level of, hey, this person knows what they're talking about. But you know they're not they're not betting only on one thing. They have a few approaches that that you know if one of them works out, this this could you know, the funding is worth it kind of thing. And I think Danielle, you, you've talked about the second one. I think earlier mentioned where to me I think at one point before where you know having things repeat themselves over and over again. Um, you know it's not, it's not it's not a science paper. I'm pretty sure I think you mentioned you know it's like this is something that you can you know you can just say it once and that's that's probably enough. I think that's something I've heard you say before too. But maybe you can elaborate. Sure. I mean, I think using um, formatting, I think to highlight mm -hmm. the, the key and relevant things that reviewers are trying to pick up on, you can kind of get away from having to be super repetitive. Um, but I mean, people are reading quickly. So you want to be 
a smidge repetitive, but not enough to like hit the reviewer over the head. Um, so there, this is, there is this balance um, that you're trying to strike. Got it. So don't feel like they're they're spending like you said. Like I think it's a, period, a thing is you like you know have them feel like they're getting a lot of information in a very short period of time versus having to spend more time. So that 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 could aggravate people a reader if they have a lot of grants to review. Yeah, that reminds me of one of my one of the things that somebody else recommended to me that has really changed my life. And that mm. you know, I, I had always thought about grants as having three aims, but you know, two aims is so much easier. <laughs> so interesting. It, you know, and there there is no real reason to have a third aim. Mm. Um, it's not going to make people like your grant more. If anything, it makes them you know hate it because they have to read another aim. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know the really cool but special thing about two aims is that your aims can sort of be opposites of each other. Interesting. Um, and so you can sort of design like you know one aim is sort of top down. I'm going to start with a complex system and and distill down the mechanism, and then the other wow. aim can be bottom up. You know, and so that's very satisfying. Just like that's so interesting to read grants like that so, you know yeah i would definitely recommend this district you getting rid of your third name that's super cool what a, that's 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 a great advice that's great advice ariel yeah, you yeah, have yeah. A, a comment so, on that peter i mean and i think you know we can talk about this for an hour but i i, I <laughs> love grants with two aims i prefer to write grants with two aims because your first aim can be exploratory and then the second one can be validation however i recommend so i once wrote one proposed a specific aims page to my program director and I sent it to her and she responded to me immediately. Are you proposing a three-year R01? So I think there's certain bias. It's really important to, to communicate that it's a five-year R01 and really show that there's enough science to do five mm. years or maybe ask for only three-year funding. So, so it's mm. important to talk to your officials. This is this is kind of the take-home message. Got and it. Know what they expect. Just out of I'm personally curious, like what, what percentage of grants have two aims versus versus say three? That you see come through, any any gut check or idea? Most grants have three aims, like okay. I agree, unless it's a fellowship. A lot of graduate students. Exactly. Yes. Put yes. We were talking about R O one. Our, yeah. our twenty yeah. one sometimes have two aims and it's mm -hmm. fine, but R O ones, big grants are expected to have three aims, which is which is very difficult to come up with. But you know, maybe that's why it takes so long to write a good grant. I yeah. I, I, feel, I feel another session one day coming up on on a debate between two to three aims <laughs> on an R O one. This seems like something that could be really exciting. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think, I think three is really the template, you know. But but yeah, there's a lot of benefits well, too. To do too well uh, i want to i want to move over to maybe a, a second topic this has been super cool to hear hear this kind of debate on on the behind the scenes you know from from the reviewer's perspective on what what you find exciting and, and pet pv um danielle you mentioned something earlier you know that one of the biggest things you can see help people go from not great to being exceptional sometimes is, is adding in figures and i know peter you said even having one on every page um so maybe an, an overall question that you know, we could uh, we could address is like you know what what are the sections that really do benefit from having figures in them? Like if if someone's thinking like, hey, I want to add great figures to my applic application, which are those which are the sections that I should focus on adding them to? Uh, maybe maybe we'll start off with uh, with with Ariel again since you you were passionate on the uh, on the aims there. <laughs> so and and I actually think that you know. Adding a figure in on AIMS page is something more recent. It happened in the past maybe 10 years. I haven't seen it mm. before, but it, it it now it's more acceptable and I love it because of how many mm. words you can explain. So I think if you have a an interesting mechanism, it would it would benefit from a figure. So if it, it would be just easier to, to, to look at the image. Um, I also um, like seeing um, images where people kind of show how all the three AIMS integrate or how one leads to another or how you know mm. or, or if you have a, some unique special technology that you're developing or using and it's not very familiar to people i think this would also benefit from a nice flow chart interesting and are there any sections that you don't like to have figures in i mean i mean if it's too, there is a thing like too many images right so i think mm -hmm. innovation doesn't require um an, a, a figure or a um, cartoon this is kind of whatever um right but yeah all the rest always benefit i also like so for example if you have um some interesting data i always mm -hmm. like when people add a schematic to explain experimental design so it's easier if there is a space obviously do not overload but if there is a place and you feel like it would explain better your experimental design or explain the results that i'm looking at yeah um, i would add a schematic a small schematic to explain what you've done that's so interesting 
Um, I know it's been a, a hot topic we've heard before. Like, do you include a figure on the Ames page? Actually, it was a, was a follow-up question. So maybe I'll I'll pass it to Peter because I know I think I saw on one of your one of the uh, examples you had it was, it was Cecilia who, who did have you know their aims her aims broken down in, in figure format. So how about you? Where are the places that you like to see figures in an application? Um, and maybe yeah, where are the places you don't? Yeah, I agree. I think significant. You know, the research plan for sure. Signet in the significance and approach. I think innovation. You know, you don't want to use too much space on it, so you probably don't want to use a add a bunch of figures. Like, I think mm -hmm. for the aims page, you know, it gets really hard because there's so much you have to have on that page. So, you know, I'd rather have a good aims page, like a, a very well written aims page with a lot of white space. Mm -hmm. and no figure, you know, than something where they really cram the text in to make room for a figure. Got it. So yeah, it really depends on like how many words you need to describe what the aims are. You know. So I guess if you're reducing your, you only have two aims. Maybe you've got a better chance of putting a figure in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> another advantage of the two aims. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a recurring theme. Um, and when, and then maybe maybe I'll, I'll ask you, and then Danielle can can help finish this point apart. But is there a certain type of figure that does go well on an AIMS page versus some that don't? Yeah, I think like keeping it really conceptual on the AIMS page. I, I don't like it when there's a lot of detail. You know, that's really mm -hmm. what the approach section is for. And so, got it. You know, you keep it at a really high level. Um, uh, and yeah, I like little diagrams that sort of tell me what the whole grants goal is. You know. But, but cool. yeah, you don't, don't need to sort of show a bunch of little details. Got it. So keep it high level. And, and Danielle, what's what's the advice that you give researchers at Columbia when they're when they're asking um, about those same questions? Like, where do they include the figures? And and I guess maybe specifically just on the AIMS page question, since that's a hot topic. Yeah, this actually comes up a lot in our our K award program, and I typically see basic scientists tend to not put one on, and the clinical um, translational and epidemiologists sometimes put it on, and it is tends to be more of a conceptual model. Um, and but the basic scientists, if they do include when I see it, maybe background significance more than on Got the it. page. Because again, it. it's it's limited, it's limited to one page, and people are trying to get their points across and explain it in that one page. Cool. Well, that's really helpful. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, and then maybe just one one more question on figures. I know, I know we are coming up to, to time, and this has been an incredible inform incredibly informative session. Um, on, on the topic of figures, yeah, what, what are some of the things, maybe, maybe a two-part question for each of you is. What are the things you look for in figures? Like when you, what's a, what makes, when, when does a figure elevate a grant to becoming like really compelling? Um, and when does it does the opposite? You know, just like you have pet peeves on, on uh, you know, on what the aims look like or when they're, when they're not connected or, or too, or too dependent or certain words, like what are pet peeves you see on figures where you, it makes you, it makes you cringe a little bit. Then maybe Danielle, we'll start, we'll start with you and we'll go Peter Ariella to, to finish us off for this one. Sure. Um, some pet peeves. I think if people are using large panels like A through J, it sometimes takes a lot to get through them. And, and sometimes it's you're hitting the river over the head maybe with too much information, right? Uh -huh. So it's not like a manuscript where you have to demonstrate something over and over again. Maybe pick, you know, the key experiment, show that, and then saying that data not shown for the other experiments you might be doing. Um, uh -huh. And also just professionalism, so general design principles, like is there enough spacing? Have you taken away the additional lines? Um, is the color scheme nice? Um, it's not a big pet peeve, but it just, it's, if it's pleasing and it looks polished and presentable, um, then that's, that's nice to go through, as well as readability. Can I read all the axes and figures? Um, can I understand what's trying, happening in the figure quickly? Um, and is the figure legend? Is there a title of like the takeaway and then what's going on in every panel that you're discussing? Um, and similar to what Ariella had said, you know, the best figures like kind of tell a little story, right? So if you have an experimental diagram and then say you have like a flow or IHC where you can visualize the effect in maybe two conditions and then you have a quantification, right? It's, it's, a, it's mm -hmm. a clear depiction of the point that someone's trying to make. That's awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah. So it sounds like similar thing, like less is more a little bit. Focus, focus your figure on something versus trying to explain too much information or be too repetitive on it as well. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Peter, why don't you, what's, what, what's, what are the, what makes a figure great for you? And then what are your, you know, one or two pet peeves that when to make it? Yeah. Happen? Yeah. I totally agree with the, the points that were made. I think you just get, throw out a couple pet peeves. Um, which will maybe be surprising for people, but you know, it, you know, one that I see a lot is that people will just sort of overload the data. You know, they'll put in a lot of data that is not related to the aims at all. So you know, it's just experiments that that person has done, 
um, that actually do not support the aim. And so, you know, I think really the goal of figures in a grant, I mean, either you're, you're showing a diagram that explains what you want to do, yeah. or you're, you're providing evidence, you know, think of yourself like a detective. You're like, <laughs> you really want to convince the reader that you're, that you're solving the case and that you have figured out that your hypothesis might be right, you know? Mm, and so it's really only essential data that, that helps your case, you know? <laughs> um, and then the, the set related to that, I guess my second pet peeve is like, I think people, you know, because there's all this pressure to have preliminary data and grants, they surprisingly often will put in figures that actually argue against their own hypothesis. Oh no, oh <laughs> <And> then, no. <laughs> I mean, it's really a fatal flaw, I think, because, you know, it shows that the writer has not really thought about what their data shows, um, mm -hmm. you know, that maybe the whole premise of the grant is wrong. Um, and so, you know, it, it really can take a, a very strong grant and turn it into a very weak grant. Um, oh, wow. Because reviewers are going to catch those errors. That's fascinating. So really trying to be laser focused on is the, does the data support what I'm doing? And, you know, the, and then double checking, like, is this dist a distraction or truly a direct, a direct supporting piece of evidence um, for what I'm trying to do? And then like stripping out all those distractions. So again, kind of like that, you know, adds add space to your grant versus adding words or figures to, to overload it. Really cool. And then is there anything specifically that makes, you know, that it elevates a grant, elevates a figure? So you're like, oh, wow, that's, those are the best figures that, that I see. Yeah, I think like, I mean, the, the talk before mine, Daniel, was, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, those figures look like they were in a, you know, you could put them in a textbook or something. I mean, they're just beautiful. <laughs> I mean, I, I think a lot of scientists don't like this conceptually that it is, I mean, it really does come down to aesthetics, you know, it's like, you know, if you look at a painting on the wall, like what, what looks nice to your eye, you know, <laughs> like that's kind of what we're looking for. You know, if you have a graph that just came out of Excel, and has really blurry text like that just doesn't look good you know got it and so just having things that look look pretty to, to makes a big difference absorb. well i'm sure i'm sure shiz will have lots of tips for for that in our last session but that's you know i, I totally agree it's sort of like you you judge you judge something quickly and that first impression counts for a lot and probably how how much you're going to sort of read into the rest of the story so make it make that first impression count um, I know, I know, I'm guilty of that myself. And then Ariella, maybe maybe just take it, take us home on the figure side. What are yeah, a couple of pet peeves and and one or two things that that make something really stand out for you? So in terms of, I, I totally agree with what Danielle. I, I I feel exactly the same way um, as mm -hmm. they do. I so I prefer, especially in the text or approach session, to have smaller figures that kind of disperse throughout the text that help me understand mm. what I'm reading, especially if it's scientific experimental design. I do not like large figures. And in terms of aesthetically pleasant, yes, definitely. So everything ideally should be aligned and also mm -hmm. kind of follow um, how my eye goes, right? So people say it's better from left to right instead of top down. So this is, these are all important things make sure there is no mistakes in your figures because wow. it's the worst you know if you look at the figure and it's like there is no well the the panels are not labeled correctly and i have to go back and, and look what is what is figure 5j and it's not really 5j it's 7a and it's it, it this can kill a grant mm. so it's very important that there is no mistakes and kind of the you said take home message i do i encourage my students to read their grants and papers aloud not mm. to uh, somebody else just sit in your room and read it aloud you will find so many mistakes and repetitions and unnecessary you know stuff that and it's going to improve the grant so just take your time and slowly read it aloud and mm. look at the figures interesting that's that's really good advice that's really good advice yeah i know that that's it sounds like similar to you know, be be your own reviewer a little bit um and then also get other people probably to review your 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 grant as well. But make sure you had a chance to kind of go through and does it sound logical when you when you read it out to yourself? Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. This has been like this has been incredible. Um, I've really really enjoyed myself. It sounds like you know uh, everyone who's been listening in has too. I know uh, we're slightly behind on schedule, but I thought maybe it'd be good to just bring up a couple a couple questions from the audience because I know there's been a ton of them um, and. There's been a couple that I've seen that have come through more regularly. So one one of the common questions, probably specifically for you know early writers, is you know how, how long do you spend on your grants? You know I know there's probably that's probably like a, a wide range. It's like how reviewers review them. Um, 
but you know, how, how long should should someone be spending preparing an R01, for example? Uh, like when should they start, and and how much overall hours and things should be going into it? And how many people should be helping you? Maybe the follow up to that one seems to. Um, we'll go we'll we'll go in reverse order again. Yeah. So um, Ariel, why don't you start us off? What's um, your a lot, and now, and <laughs> so in the again, you know, it 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 depends if you're a procrastinator like me or not like Peter. So you know, I do. So I. I, I I usually like to be under pressure when I write, but for me, it, it takes me about two months to write a good grant. So I start early, I think about figures, I outline the AIMS page, I try to finish AIMS page um, probably three weeks before the due date. Three weeks before, got it. Yes, and then once the AIMS page is ready, I send it to everybody that would agree to read it or even look at this, and then I start working on the, on the rest of the grant. But figures and AIMS page, should be done, you know, at least three weeks before. Before, cool. Peter, any different advice from your end? Yeah, I had, you know, it was sort of hard for me to listen to this, but one of my mentors uh, early on in my career read my grant and, and sat down with me and said, you know, oh, why don't you just think about not submitting for this? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's hard advice to hear, yes. <laughs> but I actually, I mean, strangely, I, like I do that all the time now, you know, I'll, I'll set a deadline for myself. And, you know, as I said earlier, I'm not a procrastinator. So yeah, I, I think two months is a good window. So you, you mm. should start working on a grant two months before the deadline um but then yeah it's really fun when you you know useful just to move the deadline back because you know the great thing about nih is they don't care when you send them your grant <laughs> so you know you have three times a year to submit um and you know your study section is not going to care if they got it you know now or a year later um and so you know you should sort of be honest with yourself you know, try to be critical of your own data and then say, you know, do I think that I actually have enough to, mm -hmm. you know, is this a perfect grant yet or is there more I can do? And if there's more you can do, you know, Keep just push it back going. for a few months, you know. Totally. Hey, Ryan. That's, that's great advice. Yeah. Hey, this is Daniel. I'm just, can I chime in real fast? Absolutely. Go for it, please. <laughs> so uh, I've been telling people I took like a year to write my R1. So I would just say that as you get better and better at writing grants, it will take less and less time. So I would there's I just don't think there's one answer. Um, just mm -hmm. don't wait till the last minute, or or yes, like um, Peter said, you know, just submit something, and then at least you're you know hopefully it'll get reviewed or you'll at least get some responses from reviewers that then you can go back and take more time to to kind of improve it. Um, but I just don't think there's one answer. I'm, I don't want to, I don't expect every single time I write a grant for it to take a year, but my first big one, it took me a while. Hey, that's, and, that, that's great advice. And I oh. wanted to follow up on what Daniel said. So yeah. for our K awardees, we have them really talk to their mentors and discuss applying six to six months to a year before they mm -hmm. want to apply. And then our program starts three months ahead of time where we're basically telling them what to write when. So they're actually mm -hmm. meeting the deadline on time. So I agree that the more junior you are, the more time you might need to make sure that you're framing your research question appropriately and you're collecting the data needed. Um, yeah. And then, you know, our, our ESI faculty writing R1s, three months, three to two, two to three months is a good timeline. But then I also have a group of people that write it the week before and get like perfect scores. So <laughs> I think it just depends on who you are. <laughs> Yeah, I think it really, I guess, I guess if you can do it, you know, or it probably depends how much work you have done in advance and how how solid a, a case you you have already. So um, I'm sure that would would depend plus the style of work you have. Cool, thank you so much for sharing all that. The, the one other question, I, just on the, on the fig, maybe the end with a figure question, is we've had a, a number of questions, when do you work on your figures in that process? Um, is that something you do uh, before the research plan? Is it something you do uh, even you know, before the aims? When, when, do you, when do you recommend working on figures or do you keep that right to the very end? Um, maybe, maybe we'll do again, we'll reverse order and we'll finish it off with Danielle, Peter and, and Ariella to, to wrap up. Sure. So I'm actually not making figures, but having worked with several faculty doing large grants and ESI faculty, um, they tend to outline their figures first. So they know what data they have and what story they're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, throughout the process, um, several of the more senior faculty when working on large complex proposals will realize that we're missing key data. And then that's when they go to their postdoc or graduate and say, hey, we need this in like, you know, a month or whatever the timeline is. So mm -hmm. it is a little bit of an iterative process to make sure that the story you're telling is compelling. 
Got it. So get those data figures done early is, is, is what you're seeing so that you know if you, could have to, if you have to fill in some blanks, you have some time to do that. Cool. And, and Peter, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think I, I continue to work on figures all the way through the process, but then I, I guess one mistake I've made is that, you know, because we all love coming up with new ideas, is that, you know, I try to write a grant on, on, on new content, <laughs> which uh, is not a good idea. <laughs> so, you know, I think what I do now is, you know, really look at the data and the figures that we have already, you know, recent papers or unpublished data from the lab, mm -hmm. and then sort of use that to to guide the aims. So I'm Got not, it. I'm not just like starting from scratch, you know, because I, gotcha. I do think it's really hard for trainees if, if their PI comes to them and says, you know, I know you're not working on this, but I need you to do like all these experiments. Cool. And, and, uh, and Ariella, maybe last. I don't have any off. revolutionary, um, <laughs> yeah, but, but it goes side by side. So I do believe that figures tell the story. So similar to what Danielle said, you know, I would mm. outline all the figures I have to see if I actually have the story to tell by just illustration, you know, if it's like a cartoon. Mm, interesting. And then, and then I fill in the blanks uh, because it takes so long to finish, like to have a complete figure. So I don't do it too early. I do some sketching like Daniel said as well. And then um, for the illustrations, but then for the figures, it's really, it has to follow the story of the words. Got it. Okay.